Hi, and welcome to Product Alliance. Today, we're interviewing a senior Uber PM, and we'll be analyzing his answers to extract a few key techniques you'll need to ace your Uber interviews and land that sought-after PM offer letter. Pay attention to how this Uber PM structures his thinking to mine for ideas, smoothly demonstrates his design and customer-focused skills in an execution interview, and takes the opportunity to dig deep into details of machine learning and A-B testing. Now, I'll hand it over to our host, Adi, to begin the interview. Take it away, Adi. Awesome. So now let's switch gears a little bit. Let's talk about, let's say you're the product manager at, at Walmart, and you're tasked with the job of building a machine learning model that'll accurately predict the sales of granola bars in any given store. Now, the only constraint is your machine learning model can only take in 10 variables. So what are some of the variables that you would look at to uh, predict sales of granola bars at any store? Cool. So obviously, there's a ton of data out there. I think um, we're going to have to figure out what are, some of the, what are some of the variables that are relevant and which, are, which ones are not. And then in terms of the end objective for this question, what we want to get to is to first figure out the variables and number two, figure out how we can determine whether those variables are good or not. Um, so for the first part, in terms of figuring out what kind of variables there are, um, we can actually break this down by thinking about um, time. Time is going to be a really valid, uh, valuable point because, um, for example, last week's data will say a lot about this week's um, or last year's growth at this season is going to be really telling for this year's um, growth. Um, and I also think that um, we're going to have to dive a bit deeper into the user as well to get an understanding, like, what does the user need for granola bar? When do people want to use uh, to eat granola bars the most and buy them? Um, and then lastly, um, something we can't forget is um, the competition and just the, the economy, how the economy do, is doing um, in that specific area, whether uh, people there are rich, whether there's a lot of uh, poor folks who can't afford it, um, whether like the, um, the ingredients to create uh, granola bars are expensive or not. This question has an intimidating brainstorming component, coming up with a full 10 ideas for variables in this machine learning model. Andy realized that it's hard to generate ideas without structure, so he wisely defined three high-level categories that will guide him through the rest of the brainstorming process. Notice that he didn't just name three categories. He also gave context to explain what would fall into each category and why that category would be useful in the first place. By building all the structure up front, Andy has positioned himself well to generate a lot of ideas, and he's also brought himself a lot of time to start thinking about ideas in the back of his head. The advantage to this approach rather than taking one or two minutes to silently jot down ideas, is that you're showing your work and keeping your interviewer engaged. So let's first dive into like time and figuring out like what we can do with that uh, piece. So for that piece, um, there are several pieces for time. So number one is last week's data. If we look at last week's data, it's like, um, if I saw $100 of sales last week, it says a lot about how much I'm gonna see this week. Um, there's a very low chance that if last week was $100, this week will be $10,000. It's very likely that if in the past it's always been trending like 10% change of week over week, then my range would be $9 to $110. So that already like, um, limits how far my prediction will be. Uh, number two is seasonal, right? It'll change year over year. And so maybe you can get a sense of like last year, how much did it vary um, at this time of the year? Because maybe granola bars are very popular during... Um, the summertime because people are out and about, but then wintertime people are staying inside. Andy does a great job of calling out seasonality here. Most candidates will mention week over week, month over month, or year over year change, but they don't understand why you would pick one time frame over another. Andy noticed that the granola bar sales will naturally fluctuate throughout the year, and he has good examples of sales rising in the summer when people are out, and he used that to justify his choice of a year over year changes in sales. Seasonality is really important dynamic for B2C or business to consumer products since demand for those products usually varies throughout the year. In the case of Uber, for example, Uber rideship might increase in the winter and colder climates since walking around outside becomes less pleasant. Comparing summer ridership numbers to winter ridership numbers won't always be that useful. So in general, make sure that you mention seasonality when you're interviewing for a consumer oriented team. And then if we think about the user needs here, when do people want to be using, uh, to be eating granola bars? Uh, so number one, it's like, if, when do people feel hungry 
and crave for a granola bar. And some of the factors I can think about behind that um, for users are, uh, number one, you're a kid and you go to school. So maybe it'd be really interesting to figure out um, how many schools are nearby. Um, and I think that'd be really interesting to incorporate into the ML model. Uh, number two, um, I personally love eating granola bars after I work out at the gym. Um, and so I think it'd be really interesting to see how many gyms are nearby or like, um, or how many parks are nearby because I was um, out at a park um, doing a quick workout or going for a run. I want to pick up a little granola bar. Um, or number three, um, what else would be super interesting? Um, let's see. How many events are happening nearby? So that means there's a high density of people. And even if it's a very small percentage of, of people who are interested in granola bar, because of the high volume, at least there will be uh, an increase. So for example, Las Vegas would have a ton of events, right? Uh, Orlando in Florida, um, whereas the suburbs probably has very little events. And so we won't be seeing uh, as much consumption. Even though this is a brainstorming and metrics question, Andy sees the opportunity to showcase his design thinking and customer focused skills. He pushed himself to think of situations where consumers would want to buy granola bars, like going to the gym, eating lunch at school, or attending an event. And he put himself in the shoes of several different types of customers and thought about how the granola bars might address their needs and pain points. In other words, Andy injected some insights that you might usually find in a product design interview or brainstorming a metrics question. This technique is very powerful, but only if used correctly. Andy didn't try to totally sidetrack his interviewer. Instead, he shifted gears for a few sentences, and during that time, he thought of some really useful ideas that helped him address his main question. And then the last thing that we'll look about look into is competition and also the economy. So how is the economy doing? Um, are people employed? Um, because when we think about granola bars, um, per unit, they might actually have um, less calories than other food. And so maybe some people might consider it as a luxury. Um, I'm not too sure. And so um, I think the economy is going to be a really important variable that we look at. Number two, competitors. If there are other stores that have a lot of granola bars that are cheaper, it's definitely going to be affecting your growth. So let's see, like, um, for Walmart, how many other Whole Foods are nearby or, like, Trader Joe's. Um, and then what else would be super valuable to look into? Um, let's see. Oh, yeah. The other last piece that I was talking about was like the ingredients. So if suddenly we see that wheat is getting extremely expensive, then does it make sense for um, these companies that produce uh, granola bars to keep the same price because they're probably going to be losing a lot of money. And so as the price increases for that, then as the price for granola bars increase, that probably is going to be reducing the demand for it because less people are willing to buy and so with all these factors, I think that that will give us a good sense of uh, estimating what the granola sales uh, will be like a month from now. Andy really pushed himself to think of creative variables towards the end. The one about prices of ingredients like wheat was both surprising and impressive. And you notice that he paused several times, saying things like, hmm, let's see. Most candidates think that doing this is a bad thing, but it actually shows that you're pushing yourself to the limit to think of new ideas and that you're really flexing your creative muscles. BDC companies like Uber put a premium on creativity since PMs there will have to dream up new ideas and help build the product roadmap from scratch. Whereas B2B or enterprise companies, your customers and clients will mostly tell you what to build. Andy really demonstrated his creativity here and thus showed that he's a strong fit for Uber's B2C culture. One thing that helped Andy come up with these creative ideas was bringing in economics which got him thinking about pricing, competitors, macroeconomic context. Bringing in adjacent subject areas is always a useful way to spark new ideas, and economics in particular is important to Uber, whose business model is all about creating and managing economic markets. And so if we want to evaluate what is going to be the, um, the, the uh, number of sales a month from now, let's see. So I'm assuming the way I want to deploy this is that each store will have their own ML model. Is that right? Yes. Okay, got it. Um, and I'm going to make a strong assumption here that each store will have access to all of this data, and they also have an, a, a lot of sales, such that like um, with all of the, they have a significant amount of data, basically. Yep, that is correct. Okay, got it. Um, so the way that I would want to do this is probably conduct some form of A/B test, um, and so what we can do is 
let's say we take a naive model or whatever that already exists in the past and we've iterated on that model with these new variables that we came up with. Um, and so we make a prediction with both of these models and then we looked a month from now, okay, how far is the prediction from reality? And then we can actually evaluate the model based on um, all the different stores. So apply that one model across all different stores, figure out what is the average gap across all of these stores and compare it with the existing one. And so with all these stores, I would assume that we would have um, enough data to figure out whether the, it's uh, statistically significantly better than the previous model that we had. And uh, what are some of these previous models? So uh, obviously you defined uh, seven or eight metrics here, and, and that's going to be your, your machine learning model that like puts a weight on each of these and, and determines that score. But uh, as while we're brainstorming, like, do you have any ideas of like what a more simple model might look like? Um, because obviously with, with machine learning, something we want to be mindful of is overfitting to the data. And so are there very simple models that um, either using some factors you listed or, or some other factors that uh, you might want to compare as a baseline against? Yeah, I think that the most naive algorithm I can think of is taking the last year's uh, seasonal changes and multiplying that with the previous week's data. So if last year at this time, I saw um, that there was a 10% change from February to March and last year and last month in February, it was a um, hundred dollars, then I would predict that this month's gonna be $90. And so I think that'd be a really naive way and then each restaurant will have their own historical data. And so that would encapsulate a lot of the other factors already, but it just wouldn't be included inside of the ML model. Andy did well to mention two things here. One was A-B testing, which is always a good thing to cite during metrics interviews. But crucially, he didn't just name drop the buzzword. He first identified the context in which A-B testing is possible. In this case, when there's many independent stores that all have enough data to run this machine learning model. Then he identified the baseline to compare his proposed machine learning model against. So we'd have both an A and a B variant. And he even touched on a methodology for comparing the variants, namely by comparing the gaps between each model and reality. In your interviews, it's essential to mention the details and the implementation of A-B tests so you show you're not just sprouting another buzzword. Andy did a great job of that. The other thing that Andy wisely mentioned was the drawbacks of machine learning. He identified that adding too many variables might overcomplicate the model or make it overfit the data. So he called out a naive or simple model as an alternative. This level of nuance showed a lot of critical thinking about the pros and cons of machine learning. In a way, he was also pushing back on the premise of the question itself. Maybe you don't need all 10 of the variables mentioned in the question. You need to be careful when pushing back like this, but it's often helpful if the interviewer is purposely asking a trick question and trying to see if you can pick up on it. Yeah, that, that, is, that is a really good naive comparison. And so let's say you have these two models. Uh, explain, I know you mentioned you would A-B test them against each other, but can you explain that a little bit more? How would you, um, let's say I give you one store location in uh, just outside of New York City, and that store gives you all of this data, you have your naive model running, and then you have uh, this seven or eight variable uh, machine learning model that you've made and you run them against each other. How long will your period be for testing? Um, wh like, how, what's your like, discrepancy? Like, how much further uh, increase in predictability does one model need to have versus the other? Like, how would you go about as these results come in? Yeah, that's a good follow-up question. So the way I would think about that is, so I'm gonna assume that there are enough stores such that we can have enough statistic data within a month and so if assuming that we are trying to test out, so it's gonna be important for us to test out the entire year because the amount of model might be biased during a specific, a specific time of the year. And it would be important for us to test out uh, throughout the entire year to make sure that it works under all circumstances, whether it's increasing or decreasing. And so um, I think it could be valuable to test over a year. And it really depends on what are the business needs right now. Do we think that we need to uh, get that model implemented right away? Or do we think that this could be a long-term uh, thing that we're going to be testing out more locally and then rolling it up. Um, but the, for the sake of this discussion, let's assume that we actually have time to evaluate whether this model is a lot better or not. And so our time frame is going to be uh, within a year. And I think a year is going to be a really good time because that's going to be capturing all the seasonality factors that might be affecting the ML model. 
Um, and so in your example of New York, I had a store. Um, I would basically be testing out this model uh, month over month in a total of 12 times over an entire year and figuring out how does it compare each time to the other model um, and what is the discrepancy. Um, on an average, do we see that this discrepancy is better than the naive model that we previously had or is it better? And then we can compile all the data across all the different stores to make the final decision on whether it performs better or not. If we see that in some areas it performs better, but then others it isn't, then I think it's an opportunity for us to dive deeper into the data to figure out, okay, why does it work specifically here, um, but, and, but work better in other regions? And maybe it's because we are overfitting the data, um, but if it works out in all regions, then I think that's a really great um, result. Awesome, yeah, I love that little insight at the end about how uh, you would take that data and, and move it back in based on what you see, because that's, you always have to be refining and making sure that uh, you're, you're not overfitting, but you're also taking new data sources that you learn about and, and integrating those uh, back into the model. So thank you, thank you for that. So in this question, Andy did a really good job of stating his assumptions, validating those with me, then breaking down for different categories of groups how he would add features to this uh, machine learning model. And he did it based on uh, user groups, he did it based on historical data and seasonality, and then he added co competition and other business factors like local GDP and an economic stability and like the pricing of competitors. All of this thinking was very structured because it was in these buckets. He was able to identify multiple things and then tie them to metrics. And at the end, I, I prodded him for a little bit more information on how he would test his algorithm versus something else. So one thing, to, which, which he answered, but one thing to make sure when you're thinking about this is always have a baseline that you should test any new model against. Uh, when asked, he definitely defined like what a good baseline would be based on seasonality. He would take the average percent change from the past year, apply it to this year, and like have that as the baseline model, like a simple regression of sorts that's that's being changed based on the seasonality uh, growth. And that's a very good model uh, to have as a baseline. But the meta concept here is, in as a product manager, whenever you're out there designing a new algorithm you're always going to want to know how well it does and you don't want to overfit to your data. And so you always need to have a baseline model that you can uh, run in comparison and have a test plan to see if month over month how your new model is performing against the existing one to know which one has more predictive power with real world data as it starts coming in. So just make sure that you have a mindful attention to that as you're uh, designing algorithms in the real world. Thanks, Adi. That was a really informative interview. Andy, the senior Uber PM you just saw, mixed concepts from economics, design thinking, supply chain, business strategy, and even A-B testing to craft a compelling answer that showcased a vast range of skills. This is especially important at a place like Uber, where PMs are expected to build up brand new verticals from scratch and therefore need to be highly creative and multidisciplinary with a wide pool of knowledge to draw on. Andy just showed how he had all of these qualities. If you want to learn all the skills that Andy combined in his excellent answer, you'll find them inside Product Alliance's flagship Uber PM interview course, where our instructors will teach you exclusive step-by-step -step tactics for acing a dozen different types of interview questions from Uber that Uber likes to ask. You'll also get over 40 example answers like this one, including the whiteboard graphics and the expert commentary you just saw, to show you how to put this theory into practice. We'll also tear down Uber's 10-year product strategy and unpack some of the key insights which we've compiled from talking to product leads across the company. We'll shed light on why the company is so laser-focused on profitability and how that hurts competitors like Lyft. And we'll explore the economics of running a two-sided market in ride-sharing, a three-sided market in food delivery, and break down Uber's innovation and operations and how it helped rapidly expand across the globe. And we'll throw in our list of PM interview questions that our team and customers have gotten at Uber in the last month word for word. This flagship Uber course is the culmination of hundreds of hours of research and conversations with product directors, hiring managers, and PM recruiters across Uber. And we're confident that the insights and skills you'll gain from this course will put you in a step ahead of the pack and help put you in a strong position to land that Uber offer letter. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.
Remember that this lesson is just the tip of the iceberg, so click below to check out the full flagship Uber PM interview course.